positive because emerging markets went into the crisis with weaker fiscal positions in general than their advanced economy peers. So today we're going to be hearing from three speakers, three panelists, Fabrizio Zampoli uh, from the BIS. So Fabrizio is the head of emerging markets uh, at the Bank for International Settlements, and he'll be talking about some of the emerging market monetary policy challenges. Rafet Gurkanyak, um, who is based at Bill Kent University, will be talking about some of the unconventional monetary policies that emerging and developed markets have uh, used in, in the last while. And thirdly, Pierre Siklos. Um, Pierre is the professor of economics from the Wilfrid Laurier University and the Balsili School of International Affairs. And Pierre will be talking about macroeconomic stability in an era of global discord the challenges for emerging market central banks. I'm hoping that in this discussion we will transverse that ground from monetary policy, also looking at fiscal policy, so looking at fiscal and monetary and even perhaps macro prudential policy uh, in a more holistic way as we look at how emerging markets battle to achieve macroeconomic stability in the present environment. Each speaker has been asked to speak for about 20 minutes, uh, and then we'll have a panel discussion with questions from the audience. Uh, so, Fabrizio, over to you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm honored to be here and to be able to present the, some of my work and the work of my colleagues at the BIS. So today I'm going to talk uh, about the fiscal challenges that many advanced and emerging markets are facing. And my presentation will show that the medium and long-term fiscal prospects are a major concern for many countries. I will argue that unsustainable fiscal policy uh, pose relevant risk to both price stability and financial stability. And I will also argue that policy institutions underpinning monetary and fiscal policy need to be preserved or strengthened. So I'm, in my presentation, I will take a global perspective. I will not talk about uh, individual countries. Uh, I will make some comparison about uh, between advanced and emerging markets. And I will partly draw on the latest BIS annual economic report, especially uh, chapter two which is in part partly related to the research that I co-author uh, with some colleagues uh, at the BIS over the past few years. So before moving on, let me remind you of the usual disclaimer. So anything that I say here uh, should be considered as my views and not necessarily those of the BIS. Okay, so I will first illustrate the current fiscal situation. I will then discuss uh, the implication for the risk to price stability and financial stability. And finally, I will highlight uh, the main policy uh, changes that are needed to address and mitigate these risks and ensure that policy remain within the so-called region of stability. So the region of stability is a concept that has been introduced in the latest BIS annual report and I will probably not have much uh, time to, in my presentation to discuss this concept, but I will try to say a few words at the end. So let me start with a, fiscal, uh, with a short term fiscal outlook. So as you know, the pandemic has led to a large increase in fiscal deficit. And now this deficit has been uh, reduced and the reduction has been bigger in countries that had the largest, larger deficit in 2020. And on average, fiscal deficit has been reduced by less in emerging markets. Sorry, I forgot to move to the slides. Um, so you can see on the left-hand side, uh, we have the fiscal deficit. As I said, the fiscal deficit has, has been reduced generally uh, by larger mining countries that had a larger uh, deficit in 2020. And on average, fiscal deficit have been reduced by less in emerging markets. Now, the good news here is that Public debt ratios, which are on the right hand side, have not increased everywhere. And in some countries, they've actually diminished or changed little. And in countries where they actually increased, uh, the increase were generally less than expected in 2020. And this has to do with a big increase in inflation 
and nominal GDP. So that's the good news. But if we look forward, the situation is less comforting. So this slide shows some stylized projections uh, of debt to GDP ratio for the next 25, 30 years. So these are in uh, our uh, chapter two of the report. So what the projection uh, tell us is that absent fiscal consolidation, debt to GDP ratio are set to climb in the long term from the current uh, historical peak. So you can see the baseline uh, projection is, the, uh, is the indicated by the red line. And the increase uh, would be substantially larger if one factor in the impact of aging expenditure, uh, which is indicated by the blue line, and even higher if we factor in <coughs> the expenditure related to the green transition and possibly the higher spending linked to the geopolitical, geopolitical events, the purple line. <coughs> so such steep trajectory, um, actually they are, these are projections, they are not forecast. But uh, so this steep trajectory illustrate uh, that the scale of adjustment needed is potentially large and hence implies risks uh, if government don't act uh, uh, in a decisive or timely manner. Another uh, fact uh, that is visible in the graph is that public debt uh, has been trending up over the past 50 years in advanced economies. And that has also been trending up in emerging market, but uh, at, at least, uh, at least uh, in, in very recent period, at least since the great financial crisis in 2008. Now, the upward trend and the additional spending pressure suggest that it might be difficult to reduce that ratio in the future. So if past trends are a guide to the future, um, we might see governments stabilizing debt, but at a higher level and not uh, than today, but not necessarily reducing it. Now, can higher inflation help in the future? So we have seen that inflation has helped reduce or keep uh, that ratio stable in the past couple of years. So one can ask uh, whether inflation can also be helpful in the future. So now uh, the consensus among economists, also confirmed by some recent uh, research at the IMF, is that higher inflation can reduce that ratios only temporarily, especially if it is unexpected. But in the long run, uh, inflation, if, if anticipated, will not help much. And the graph on the left-hand side shows what happens to that ratio five years after an increase in inflation. So here we pull data together um, regarding inflation and, and debt from the 1970s, for example, of advanced and emerging markets. So you can see that higher inflation has, uh, if anything, led to higher, not lower, debt to GDP, GDP ratio. And the, the impact is hardly different from zero even at high inflation, uh, inflation rates. So I have to also emphasize that we took out from, this, uh, from the sample period of that restructuring. So, um, so another thing that is important to notice is that uh, the debt projection shown in the previous slide um, were built under the assumption that interest rate will stay below the growth rate. Now, should interest rate exceed growth rate again, then the debt pressure will, uh, will increase considerably. Uh, and these effects will be compounded by the already high uh, level of public debt. So on the right hand side, we did some counterfactual simulations. So if uh, today interest rates were as high as those in the mid 1990s, all else equal, the debt service burdens uh, would be, um, would over time exceed their historical peak. So, and the reason is that you have higher debt today. Now, this grim outlook uh, for government debt raises serious risk for price and financial stability going for war. So let me turn to the risk to price stability. Now, persistent fiscal deficit can put up poor pressure on inflation and the effect depends on central bank credibility and independence, as well as government prudence in ensuring fiscal uh, sustainability. As you can see in this graph, the estimated inflationary impact of a fiscal expansion is greater 
when the fiscal policy regime is less concerned with fiscal sustainability. So in other, uh, it is profligate, so we use this word to indicate this regime, is profligate rather than prudent. So the yellow bars are higher than the green bars. Now prudent here means that the government tightens fiscal policy in response to higher debt, given the cyclical position and other factors. And profligate means the opposite. So when the government is faced with higher debt, it doesn't tighten fiscal policy. Now, you can also see from this graph that central bank independence, or high, high degree of independence, is, is key for the outcome. So the inflationary effects of deficit are much larger when independence is low than when it is high. And there is no much difference uh, when, uh, when sent, uh, between the two fiscal regimes when central banking has a high degree of, uh, of independence. So the good news is that high central bank independence allows to keep inflation low when in fiscal policy is profligate. So this is what the, the data tell us. Now, these findings are based on a research paper that I co-author with some colleagues at BS. If you are interested in the details, I uh, invite you to, to check the working paper. Now, the inflationary effects of fiscal stimulus are larger in emerging market and developing economies than in advanced economies, so on average, the effect is found to be uh, approximately double. And we also have evidence that the transmission of the fiscal stimulus in emerging markets works differently than in advanced economy. The key difference is the behavior of the exchange rate. So the usual textbook uh, response uh, of exchange rate in advanced economy to a fiscal expansion is normally an appreciation of the exchange rate, but by contrast, uh, we find that in emerging market, the exchange rate tends to depreciate uh, when there is a fiscal expansion. And this slide shows uh, what goes on in emerging market. So in the first graph, one standard deviation increase in the primary, in primary fiscal deficit leads to an increase in sovereign risk as proxy by the CDS spread. The increase in the CDS spread, uh, in turn, is then accompanied by a currency uh, depreciation. This is shown in the second graph. And for a given amount of currency depreciation, uh, the impact of inflation, that is the exchange rate pass through, is generally larger for advanced economies than, than advanced economies. This is what is shown in the, in the third graph. So overall, these facts explain why, on average, uh, the inflation effect of a fiscal expansion is larger in an emerging market than advanced economy. And here, uh, in a recent paper, we investigated uh, this mechanism uh, in, more, uh, in more detail. So we find that the inflation effect is not only larger in emerging market, but is also strongly nonlinear. So in other words, he has a greater impact uh, not only on the on average inflation, but also on the upside tail risks. Uh, so the distribution becomes skewed to the right, if you like. And there is no evidence that the same uh, uh, hold true for, uh, so this nonlinearity generally don't hold true in the sample of advanced economy. We also show that fiscal deficit raises the risk of future currency depreciation. Again, the, the effect is uh, highly nonlinear. And we show that this channel is closely related to measure of sovereign risk, different measures. Um, and importantly, we relate the channel to debt composition. So the risk, of, to the, uh, the risk to currency depreciation and the risk to future inflation are higher the larger the share of foreign currency debt or the larger the share of non-residents uh, held debt. Now, the good news is that these, these effects are strongly attenuated when the central bank is an inflation targeter. And we also find that the level of effects reserve attenuate the link. So going back to the discussion in the previous session, uh, yeah, effects reserves are quite important. So let me now turn to the financial stability. So unsustainable uh, public finances can also trigger or amplify uh, financial instability, and the direction of causality goes both ways. Uh, there is this, this, this thing called this, uh, the sovereign bank do, doom loop. So in one, in one direction, an increase in sovereign risk can cause uh, financial stress 
by generating losses for financial institution. Uh, so banks that hold public debt may see uh, their holding losing value. Higher sovereign risk can also lead to higher funding costs for all banks, uh, regardless of how much they hold, and, uh, and can lose, and generally leads to a deterioration of the broader economy, which uh, uh, which can uh, can affect the uh, the loan portfolio of banks. So it's generally uh, increasing sovereign risk is generally associated with. Uh, in increasing financial risk. So in the other direction, financial instability can undermine fiscal soundness, and it can do so directly, as the sovereign uh, may need to backstop the financial system if there is a crisis, or indirectly, if the economy tanks, uh, the fiscal authority needs to intervene to stabilize output. And we see, um, um, we see here on the... Uh, we see on the, on the left-hand side panel, we see that the surge in public debt following a banking crisis is typically, is typically quite large, so it's well above 10% percentage points of GDP in both advanced and emerging markets. And we can also see from the other panels that the two-way causality that I just described is a key reason why government and bank credit rating tend to co-move with, with each other over time and, and across countries. Now, um, as sovereign debt has increased uh, after the great financial crisis, financial institutions have also absorbed growing amounts of public debt, so leading to greater exposure to public debt. So the, the potential for the financial sector to suffer losses today is, uh, is greater. Um, so you can see that banks uh, in advanced economy are more exposed today. Uh, then back in 2008, as to emerging market exposure, they have diminished before the pandemic, but they increased sharply uh, afterwards. And you can see on the right-hand panel that the exposure also varies uh, in terms of, uh, as a ratio of capital, they also vary considerably across countries. Now, interest rate risk or duration risk has also increased substantially given the lengthening of public debt maturities uh, and despite the large scale asset purchases by central banks. So here on the left hand side, uh, these are the average increases in the, in the maturity of debt issued by the treasury. It doesn't take into account uh, the, the large scale asset purchases by central banks. But if you look at the country that they have also, for which we have the data, I mean, uh, taking into account also the uh, asset purchases by the central banks, it's still true in general that uh, the, the market, the private sector, all the longer maturity uh, debt. So here the maturity has gone up from five years in both advanced and emerging market to more than nine years in advanced economy, about seven years in, uh, in emerging market. Um, and over the past year, we have, we have already seen I don't need to mention this. We have seen we already seen how interest rate risk uh, alone can cause stress, stress in the system. Um, now the stress could be much more severe if the credit worthiness of some of the sovereigns is questioned at some point in the future. Now the level the level of debt tends to amplify interest rate risk. So we're showing this in the in the second and third panel. So in the sec second panel we show that the reaction of, a ten -year yield, of the 10-year yield to an interest rate hike of 100 basis points tends to be larger in high debt countries. Uh, and, and we also show that the effect is also bigger in emerging market than in advanced uh, economy. And one of the reasons is that the hike uh, tend to increase sovereign risk uh, uh, when the country already has high level of debt. So what can we do um, to address this risk? So very quickly. Uh, for fiscal policy, it is essential to ensure that debt evolves along uh, an, an ambiguously sustainable path. Regarding strategy, it would be important to pay greater attention to the impact of financial factor on fiscal space, uh, such as the potential uh, fiscal cost of banking crisis. So here in the slide, I cited a couple of papers that I have written with uh, Claudio Borio and other colleagues. To, uh, on how to account for financial factors. So one paper adjusts fiscal balance using, 
uh, you know, the, the, the finance, finance neutral output gap that, that Claudio, Borio, and others have, have uh, developed. The other paper look at the cross section of banking crisis, the fiscal cost measure as the increase in public debt over the, uh, the, the following five years. So here we find that uh, there are four factors that affect the fiscal, uh, fiscal cost uh, consistently. Two factors uh, worse, worsen the fiscal cost, and, and this is the level of private credit and the speed of increase of the private credit before, before a crisis. The other two factors are mitigating factors. One is the uh, aggregate level of bank capital, and the second is the level of FX reserves. Now, for monetary policy, the priority is to ensure uh, price stability, paying attention, due attention to financial stability. Regarding the strategy, monetary policy should exploit the self-stabilizing properties of low inflation regime. Um, so, uh, you know, Claudio and colleagues, uh, Igon Zakrayeg uh, and other colleagues at BAS have written this paper on the two inflation regime. And uh, one implication from that is that uh, um, if you are in a low inflation regime, you don't need to respond uh, aggressively uh, to moderate, even if persistent, shortfalls of inflation from narrowly uh, defined targets. So there could be some space to, uh, to let inflation uh, fall sh short of the target. Uh, um, you know, there are, of course, costs uh, cost related to, uh, to low interest rates uh, in terms of uh, building financial vulnerability. And so this, this clearly would reduce the, the incidence of long period of unusually low interest rates. So, um, and regarding institution, uh, as, as uh, shown in, uh, in the research I presented before, safeguarding central bank independence is, is even more important if fiscal position continues to deteriorate. Now, other policy play a complementary role. Uh, obviously, uh, prudential policy, the first line of defense for financial, against financial instability, uh, which, uh, so they, they uh, uh, enhance resilience and mitigate the build-up of vulnerability. Structural policy is the prime, uh, primary tool to achieve higher sustainable growth by improving the supply side of the economy. Now, the BIS annual economic report talk about the need for a change in policymaker mindset. So policymakers need to recognize the limitation of demand management policy. So if you want to improve growth sustainably in the longer run. The only tool for achieving higher growth is structural policy and, and, and also uh, uh, investment in, in infrastructure and, and the like. Now, let me say a few words to conclude on the, on the concept of the regional stability. So the BS has introduced this concept in its latest annual economic report. So the point is to highlight uh, that both monetary and fiscal policy interact with each other in ways that can improve or can worsen stability. And uh, here, uh, so this regional stability is not captured by simple metrics like the debt to GDP ratio, for example, uh, sorry, the, the ratio for the debt to GDP ratio or other, um, or other uh, uh, simple metric. Uh, and, in, and, and it's important to recognize uh, that uh, this regional stability can uh, can change depending on structural changes in the economy, in the global economy, in the domestic economy. It can also, and very important is to recognize uh, that both monetary and fiscal policy have cumulative effects over time. So, for example, if policies successfully boost upward growth temporarily in the short run, uh, it may also uh, permanently raise debt, for example, and which can make the economy more vulnerable in the future. So we need to take uh, more seriously into account the intertemporal effects of policy. And I think you know, the, the, this concept uh, uh, is just helpful to focus, focus our minds. And in terms of research, clearly there is a lot to do to map uh, this region of stability, uh, so to, to link the sets of fiscal monetary policy that leads to, uh, to stability to, uh, to all the relevant factors. So I think it's a good... Uh, you know, good research uh, agenda for the future. Uh, so I stop, stop here. Thank you very much.
thank you, Fabrizio Refet. Emerging marketness is not a thing in its own right. Emerging markets is a designation that we use to group a bunch of countries. And for some purposes, that's a very useful grouping. And at some point, I'm going to see my slides and begin to go over them. But until then, um, that grouping actually is, for some questions, very useful, and for some others, very hurtful. The literature takes that grouping fairly seriously. And there's almost two separate kinds of economics for advanced economies versus emerging markets, whereas probably there shouldn't be. In fact, from the perspective of thinking about unconventional monetary policies, when the literature asks a question that has both emerging markets and unconventional monetary policies in it, Invariably, that question has been, how have the emerging markets been affected by unconventional monetary policies of advanced economies? And there was never a recognition that these countries may be doing or thinking of doing unconventional monetary policies themselves. There is never research on how has unconventional monetary policies in emerging markets affected these economies? Can they do unconventional monetary policy? Should they do monetary po unconventional monetary policy? So my talk is going to be about unconventional monetary policies in emerging markets. And that topic is weird in that, you know, can emerging markets do unconventional monetary policy? Um, from a application perspective, of course they can, because most of them have. So, you know, by experience we know that, sure, we can. Perhaps better question is, should we? And that becomes a iffier, deeper, more important question. Let me, following Atif's um, good presentation outline, begin with the conclusions. Right? You know, can emerging markets do unconventional monetary policies? Of course, yes. And in fact, you know, if you, are, you have a central bank who is able to do what is labeled conventional monetary policies, apparently you're able to do policy, your policy has traction, and so, you know, conventional, unconventional, these are just random labels. Because if you think about, I'm going to come back to this, but what we now call conventional monetary policy, you know, setting the interest rate, 50 years ago, that would have been extremely unconventional. In fact, you know, 70 years ago, if you talk to central bankers about you know, money that is not on a gold standard and is never going to go back to it, they would have found it, you know, massively unconventional. Right. So, conventional and unconventional are just you know, things we're used to. I think those labels are correctly used. Conventional isn't you know, good or, it's not a value label. It's just that, you know, it's the standard toolkit. But then, one ought to ask, why is that toolkit standard? And the answer, it seems, isn't that, you know, oh, it was our lack of imagination. That is, we should have used these unconventional policies before the global financial crisis, you know, in the 80s, 90s, 2000s, too, um, but we didn't because we couldn't think of them. That is not it. There is a reason why those conventional policies are conventional. Those are actually very good policies, right? Um, then the question is, why is it that we're using the unconventional ones now? And for the advanced economies, the answer was because you have to. It's not the advancedness. It's that your lower bound was binding. You did your conventional policies, ran out of conventional policy space, and then had to do something else. And that's why you had to come up with these unconventional policies. And that argument actually fails for most of what we label emerging markets, because those countries did not hit their conventional policy space limits. Hence the question, why do unconventional policy then? What we think of as unconventional monetary policy and often, you know, group under quantitative easing is forward guidance is often thought of as unconventional too. There's nothing unconventional about that. Central banks have been providing guidance for a very long time. Central bankers like to talk. When they talk, they provide guidance and that, right? 
It's just that we did not have a label for this until the conscious use of this to affect longer term interest rates. But it's, it's really the use of the balance sheet itself and not the policy instrument as a separate policy tool that is unconventional. And central banks have been using their balance sheets for this purpose recently for three separate reasons that should not be lumped under QE. One is for cyclical stabilization. This is the genuine QE, right? You know, when the Fed began to expand its balance sheet, the idea was we brought down the rates as low as we can. There is still more expansionary policy impetus needed. Hence, we're just going to dump money on the money markets and hope that it's going to do something, right? That's QE. Fine. The second one is our fiscal balances require us to monetize some to some extent. There is a very nice term for it. It's called fiscal dominance, and it's not QE at all. And that's something that really should to be avoided. The third one is my financial markets are going down the drain. I have to do something about it. You're using your balance sheet for that again, and oftentimes that's very good policy too, but that has nothing to do with the cyclical stabilization. It really is you're trying to limit a market dislocation. Right. Now, all of those concerns are as legitimate for emerging markets as for advanced economies. But for the first one, before you run out of your conventional policy space, there is no point in going down the unconventional route. The second one is a great concern for all economies actually, but more so for emerging markets where the checks and balances might not be as strong, right? And oftentimes you don't want your policymakers the politician policymaker, the fiscal policymakers, to realize that you actually can do these things. Because the moment you begin to use your balance sheet, somebody's going to say, aha, uh -huh, never thought you could do this. Maybe you should do more of it. And that's something to be avoided. The third one actually is as applicable to any economy with a financial market. And if you see that your financial markets are broken, making that designation, deciding that, you know, this is not a fundamental movement, but it really is mispricing of sorts. That's not the faint of heart, but every now and then we have to do this, right? And if your policy call is this is mispricing and that mispricing is going to have real effects, you have every right and obligation to interfere, and that's gonna look like unconventional monetary policy. So this is a chart of emerging markets that have engaged in unconventional monetary policies. And this is not a short list of countries. It's all over the place. So although the literature hasn't turned its gaze towards this yet, emerging markets have been as active in unconventional monetary policy making as advanced economies. I'm gonna skip this, right. But talking about these unconventionalness requires first asking, you know, what is conventional? Right. And again, it's really in the eye of the beholder because a lot of policies that we think now as conventional would have been very unconventional 50, 70, 80 years ago. Okay. Then again, um, we understand what we're talking about. More or less, the toolkit that was in the playbook of central bankers when the global financial crisis hit that's conventional. Things that we came up with afterwards, those are unconventional bits, okay? Fine, so let's, let's use that um, taxonomy. And, and think about how different are these, okay? Because if you think about QE, for example, and you want to explain some economist in the 1980s about QE, the central bank is going to go all in and buy a ton of securities, they would have looked at you and said, it's called an open market operation. We do this every day. And that's factually correct, right? QE is a particularly large and targeted open market operation, okay? So in, in a sense, what we are talking about, although as central bankers, we are very interested in the you know, little details and differences between particular policy actions, at a sufficiently high level of abstraction, it's just central banking policies, okay? And if your central bank has traction over financial markets, if you're able to do any policy, you're most likely able to do a lot of policies. 
because if what you do matters, then you can do similar things with different policy tools. In that sense, unconventional policies and conventional policies are not all that different. Then why think of the, some policies as conventional, some as unconventional, why treat these as different animals? In my mind, there are several reasons. One is, having used them for so long, we actually understand how and why the conventional policies work. Unconventional policies, even in advanced economies, empirically we see they work, theoretically we don't quite get why they work. And that's a very unsatisfactory way of thinking about policy design. It's also the case that a lot of these unconventional policies have greater and first order distributional effects. If you're going in and buying particular securities, you're changing the prices of those securities. If you're doing this with things that are not treasuries, you're actually messing with private financial market pricing. And that's a large wealth transfer that you're doing. That has political economy repercussions, but also it forces your policymakers, this time central bank policymakers, to think about those questions. Our central bankers are not built to address those questions. Our policy committees are not designed to deliberate on distributive consequences of monetary policy. So those are things that are perhaps best avoided until you are better set up to address the questions, especially if conventional policies are still available to you. Now, <clears throat> what is it that forced the central banks to do unconventional monetary policies? Short answer is extraordinary times. I think that's a correct answer. But what is it that was extraordinary? In some cases, the extra extraordinariness was that, you know, it's a sequence of negative shocks to economic activity. Nothing extraordinary about that. But I found my policy rate constrained from below. That was the extraordinary thing. Fine. That forces you to do something different. The other one is I came across a shock that was so out of the blue, so not thought of before, that the shock itself was extraordinary. And my policy toolkit wasn't designed to address this. COVID is one such thing, right? You know, the whole world shut down. This is not just a large negative demand shock. It's a really, you know, fundamentally different animal that I had to deal with. Or, you know, the world decided that my mortgage market is crap and everybody is dumping this, okay? It's a fundamentally different thing from a, you know, trickling of negative shocks to your demand or inflation or whatnot. And those things require a different set of tools to address. So what do these central banks do in normal times, normal shocks of normal sizes where you can do policy, right? Most central bankers will tell you some combination of inflation control and output gap control. That by itself, we're so used to this that we don't ask the question, but it's actually really legitimate to ask, why give one institution both mandates? In particular, if you're just giving that institution one policy tool. This is a really important question that most central bankers and research on central banking doesn't ask because most research on monetary economics starts from the assumption that the central bank is the only policymaker and then asks, given that and given the various imperfections in the world, how are you going to balance competing trade-offs? Okay? And the answer always turns out to be, well, you have to put weight on all of these concerns to the extent that they are affected by your policy tool. That, of course, is a very, very misleading characterization of the world because effectively you're saying the world is characterized by multiple inefficiencies and one policymaker who's struggling to fix all of these, right? The world is much better characterized by multiple inefficiencies and many policymakers with many tools. And one has to think about the correct distribution of mandates between those policymakers. And in fact, the games that those policymakers begin to play with each other. The sense in which this is first order important is the following. Imagine that you are the Fed, for example, in 2010, 11. 
where you have lowered the policy rate to about zero, and you're thinking, okay, what next? Because we haven't provided enough stimulus. Any sane economist would have said, well, do fiscal policy. In fact, great time to do fiscal policy because borrowing is very cheap. And you know, Keynes, exactly for these purposes, said, in these situations, borrow and spend. Your political economy actually precluded this. The fiscal expansion wasn't large enough. And the central bank said, okay, I'm gonna do something. Now, the question that we have to ask is, if the US Congress didn't think the Fed would come up with something, the Fed would be the residual claimant of any kinds of policies, would they be so confident in not doing more fiscal policy? Are central banks incentivizing other policymakers to be worse policymakers by trying to pick up pieces of all kinds of badly done policy? That, I think, is a question we ought to be asking more frequently. And the fact that central banks are now able to do unconventional monetary policy makes central banks seem to be even more omnipotent than before, and therefore makes other policymakers feel much more at ease to say, let the central bank deal with this. And that's not good for central banks, but that's really not good for these other policy concerns. Because we, central bankers, aren't equipped to address those. And given the sense that we may, is actually making things worse. Okay, talked about this. Now, one use of unconventional monetary policy, I think, is well done for every country. That's the market distress, right? You know, something happens, people are doing whatever. You know, the, F familiar term is there's a fire sale of assets. You don't want this because you understand that this is going to have real consequences. You understand that people are going to regret this. That's not fundamental pricing. Okay, you step in and make sure that it doesn't happen in the first place. Well done, right? Forward guidance. In general, also well, well thought in the sense that if you have information that the markets don't have, in particular about your own goals, your own objectives, and how you're going to go at that. Sharing that is good policy, okay? There's the general understanding that humans are very bad in thinking in, in conditional terms. So you tell them, if this happens, I will do that, and they hear, I will do that. And that's something we'll have to dance around, but it doesn't take away from the importance of being clear about your policy path to the extent that you yourself is clear about it, okay? The cyclical QE is the easiest one in terms of the practicality. That is, market distress, you have to decide that this is non-fundamental, you have to decide that it's badly priced fire sale, you have to decide that you have the tools to address this, that it's not gonna blow up on your face, that the political economy concerns aren't going to be huge, whatnot, right? Forward guidance, it's really tricky because with the purest of intentions, you're gonna say, I see myself doing this because I see inflation doing this and output doing that and whatnot, right? Inflation does something else, output does something else, you do something else and people begin to scream. QE is, it's an open market operation. It's easy, right? But it's difficult to explain why you're doing this. It's difficult to wean your treasury off of QE when the time comes. And it's difficult to think about the political economy of this altogether. So, of the three types, I think, in terms of financial market dysfunction, and I think it's irrelevant whether your central bank is the financial market regulator or the bank regulator or not. Because your financial market regulators, bank regulators, do not have the capability to intervene the central bank is able to. In fact, the way I see it, the reason why the FSB was folded back into the Bank of England was precisely this. At the end of the day, the buck always stops at the central bank. So it's better to be prepared for that contingency. And there are cases where you do want to say, yes, you know, this is a private equity market. 
in theory, I have nothing to do with this, but if that market goes down the drain, it's gonna pull a lot of financial institutions with it, it's going to be a huge negative demand shock, so I'm gonna stop it now because I understand that this is non-fundamental, right? I think this is good policy regardless of whether this is a, you know, advanced economy, emerging market, whatnot, okay? On the other hand, it does create issues of the central bank becoming the counterparty of last resort and the market participants expecting you to do this over and over and over again. Things that we will have to learn, right? It's different when we are thinking about other kinds of unconventional monetary policies. I think I am resolved that Addressing financial market dysfunction is the right way of doing things, and in fact, the old adage of, you know, if there is a stock price bubble, let it happen. When it pops, this was the Greenspan term, right? We're gonna pick up the pieces. Picking up the pieces turns out to be more expensive than we thought it would be. So not letting that happen in the first place, if we are able, is better policy. And that's one way of thinking of unconventional monetary policy, okay? If your policy tool is constrained, then you're thinking of a different kind of political economy. If your tool is constrained, surely somebody else's policy tool is unconstrained. And it's better if they do their job. But that's a game of chicken. And it may be better to lose it than to make a you know, point of it, okay? The big problem here is the moment your central bank is using its balance sheet, that's a huge balance sheet. And you could do whatever you want with it. And once your politicians begin to see that, ooh, you know, this is feasible, you're gonna get a lot of pressure to do it, to do it again, to do more of it, to do it longer. And we have examples in the recent past from Indonesia, Philippines, Ghana, some more closer by than others, where this was ex exactly it, okay? None of these countries called it monetization of debt. It was monetization of debt. These weren't countries that were in need of QE, but they were countries in need of fiscal space, and the central bank turned into a fiscal agent for this purpose. And the risk here is that you're a good central bank that is reasonably independent, has the right ideas. You do QE for cyclical stabilization purposes. Your government realizes this was a great fiscal benefits, and then you invite the political pressure on you because you show that you are capable of doing this. So that's, that's the tricky thing that makes me say, for most countries, this kind of QE is best avoided unless you really have to, meaning before you hit the zero lower bound, you're better off not doing the QE so that your fiscal authority is not going to think of you as a QE-capable agent too. All right. Um, I'm gonna skip these, but in about two months time, there's going to be a paper associated with this talk, and you're more than welcome to take a look at it. The good cases are, in fact, the best cases of doing this is South Africa and Thailand, right? You know, short, targeted, really clear why they were doing this, okay? And not so good cases are Indonesia and Philippines, and then the terrible cases are Ghana and Nigeria. And, and this really is a continuum of countries that said, there's something fishy going on, I'm gonna just nip it at the source versus, yeah, okay, we may or may not be doing this, but well, let's do it, versus we shouldn't be doing this, but we're told to do it, and here we are, okay? So the big risks of QE for any country is one, you're taking on credit risk, and if that risk is realized, there is no end to the, I don't know, bad mouthing you're gonna hear. Right. That was a big concern for the Fed when they were doing their maiden lane policy. That was a big concern for Bank of England a year ago. And we actually got lucky in that those risks were not realized. But as we keep on doing this, as we keep on using the central bank balance sheet for financial market intervention purposes, sooner or later, at once, that risk is going to realize some central bank is going to say, and my losses on this intervention is so many billion dollars, okay? That's not going to be a easy congressional or whatever political hearing after that, regardless of whether this was good policy ex ante or not, okay? The distributional effects is a big deal, and I think this is not a 
completely um, vacuous concern. That is, you know, if we have this essentially unlimited balance sheet that repeatedly helps Wall Street, why doesn't it help Main Street as well? That's not an illegitimate question. And whether you want that question to be posed or not limits how much of unconventional policies you want to do. Okay. The last one, and for many of countries that are like Turkey, um, is a particular concern, is even if you were not pushed into QE because of fiscal concerns, once you begin to do it, the fiscal concerns will be realized because the fiscal policymaker is going to say, ooh, you know, I got into all these planning at a low rate environment and you'll be killing me once you get out of those low rates or high liquidity. And thus, why don't you do more of this? That's a very difficult problem to get out of and one has to really think about the end game before starting unconventional monetary policies in this regard. You have to have great clarity between the central bank and the fiscal authority on, look, I'm doing this on my own volition, I'm increasing my balance sheet, and I will be decreasing it on my own volition too. So don't count on it being there for a long time. This is much easier said than done. All right. Um, and thus, I guess the big point here is emerging marketness is irrelevant in terms of thinking of monetary policy. If you're able to do any kind of monetary policy, you're able to do any kind of monetary policy. You may as well do unconventional ones. The conventional ones were conventional for a reason. Much less first order distributional effects, much clearer transmission mechanisms, much easier to reverse. To the extent that you're able to go with those, go with those. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Refet uh, Pierre. I hope this works. All right. Uh, first, I'd like to uh, thank the um, South African Reserve Bank for uh, inviting me and including me in this conference. I'm going to start with uh, sort of my remit was to talk about macroeconomic stability and the challenges that uh, central banks and emerging markets uh, face. And central bankers have a usual disclaimer. Uh, I'm an academic, so I have a different set of uh, disclaimers, once you'll see. Oops. There we go. So just to give you an idea of the kind of data I'm going to talk about and uh, examples I'm going to use, when I think of emerging markets, it's useful to follow the definition that others follow, which is the definition the IMF uses, but I'm, always, I'm not always going to talk about emerging markets as a group. I will be selective and select some emerging markets and uh, suggest that uh, what is true for some of these emerging markets is true more generally. It may not exactly be that th the case, but uh, sufficiently accurate that I'll go with that. I'm only going to go back to 2000 when I show you some data, not because Earlier history uh, may not matter, but simply just uh, for convenience. And occasionally I'm going to sort of distinguish between sort of pre-COVID, if you like, and the period since COVID, because obviously uh, differences have occurred. And because I will aggregate from time to time by looking at emerging markets as a group, uh, there's always the possibility of some aggregation bias. Otherwise. The data I'm going to use is uh, from fairly uh, standard sources, so I'm not going to uh, use some source that you've never heard of. Now, the first obvious question is what do we mean by macroeconomic stability, and what kind of framework do I have in mind when I think about the elements and what contributes or what detracts from macroeconomic stability? So I tend to think, and I think by now others would, might agree, that when we think of macroeconomic stability, it's a version of being less susceptible or, if you like, less vulnerable to shocks of various kinds. Now, of course, there are different kinds of shocks, and I'll come back to that in a moment. But more generally, you can think of stability as being linked or related to the concept of resilience. 
Now, whether resilience is enough is unclear because it's resilience within a system. And the system, at least when it comes to monetary policy, is defined by a particular monetary regime. And I'll briefly talk about that toward the end of uh, my talk. Now, in terms of the framework, well, for good or ill, macroeconomists are still uh, reliant on a, a version of the new Keynesian type model with all its uh, struggles. And in spite of its struggles, it uh, can be a useful way of thinking about the impact of shocks, particularly if we want to distinguish between aggregate demand and aggregate supply shocks, global versus uh, domestically sourced shocks. And also, when it comes to uh, monetary policy, the, what happens when you are near or at the effect of uh, lower bound or the zero lower bound, if you prefer, and uh, the role that uh, unconventional monetary uh, policies can play. Now, this has some link to resilience, but only up to a point. So resilience, uh, there are different ways and different uh, fields have different ways of defining resilience. So the one I'm sort of, I often think of, it's not the only one, is uh, what engineers think of when they think of resilience, and they think of redundancy. Now, it's a little bit more difficult to think of redundancy when you talk about macro policy, but one way I suppose to think of it is that you increase the toolkit. And that's part of the reason why you have so-called unconventional monetary policies, is that you'd rather use something else, the usual conventional policies, as Refet talked about, but uh, your system or your policy regime may be more resilient if you have something else in your toolkit. Now, I won't talk about how wide that toolkit ought to be. That's a, a separate conversation. However, in some work I've, uh, I'm doing with uh, Chris Hardwell, uh, there are different kinds of uh, resilience. And in particular, macroeconomists, again, uh, tend to think of economic resilience. But another form of resilience is uh, political resilience. And the two are hard to separate. And I'll just give you a little bit of a an inkling of why both are necessary. In other words, economic resilience may be necessary, but not sufficient. But I'll come to that a little bit later. Now, the challenges I'm going to outline that emerging market central banks and emerging markets more generally face are these four. There probably are others. I'm not going to list them in order of importance, and I'll discuss some uh, more extensively than others. So the, the role of the exchange rate regime, the source of shocks, and here it makes sense for me at least, I think, to distinguish between domestic and global shocks. Institutional factors. I think institutions play an important role in this story. And then when it comes to central banks, um, how they communicate uh, with uh, markets and the public more generally. So I'm going to start in the first bit by giving you a series of stylized facts. So I'm going to go very quickly over the pictures. I know that uh, a picture is supposed to tell a thousand words, but uh, it's also true that a picture is sort of what you see is in the eye of the beholder. And instead, I'm going to focus on what I see in those pictures from those stylized facts. And I'm going to divide them by in various categories. You can think of those as representing uh, the elements that one might think of when we think of what, what I've described as macroeconomic stability. So here's a picture, and on the left you have since 2000 for a selection of advanced and uh, emerging markets. The thick lines are the advanced economies. The remainder are the, uh, the, uh, the remaining lines are from emerging markets. And on the right-hand side, a focus on more recent periods. You can already see there are some important differences in the behavior of policy rates before the recent events and since the rise in policy rates which we're experiencing uh, over the last uh, several uh, months. So what are some of the takeaways from here? Well, I see three that at least I think are worth considering. Uh, the policy rates, and others have already mentioned this, are more synchronous both in advanced and emerging markets than before. It is true that policy rates in many emerging markets rose a little bit earlier, in some cases quite a bit earlier than in advanced economies. But of course, these emerging markets had fewer worries about the effect of uh, lower bound. And so that's why conventional uh, was the right way to go. 
But what's interesting is that the, the gap in policy rates, if you look at the earlier period versus the more recent period, uh, those gaps remain elevated. But that's the bad news, I suppose. Uh, the good news, is, however, is that historically, those gaps in policy rates are smaller than the historical norm. And there's a fairly clear reason why that's the case. So here I'm going to move on to inflation. But here there's two kinds of inflation at least. There's probably more than one can think of. Again, same type of picture on the left-hand side with the advanced economies, the thicker lines. And the, on the right-hand side, you have the more recent period. And again, you can see you can emerging some differences between the history and the more recent periods, which helps partly at least explain the uh, takeaways from the policy rate. The other aspect is core inflation. Now we know that the remit of many central banks is typically in terms of some form of headline inflation, but central bankers will tell you for uh, fairly clear reasons that what they really are looking at is the behavior of core inflation. That's why so much of the conversation and the narratives these, way, uh, these days from central banks is about uh, what's happening to core inflation and why it's not falling as fast as they might wish. So what are some of the takeaways from these last two pictures? There's, again, synchronous developments in inflation, which matches the synchronous developments in policy rates. But the, inf the gap in inflation rates, this is headline inflation, uh, it remains lower than it was historically. Historically, when there were shocks, we can debate whether they were as large or not, of course, but uh, they were much higher. When, it when you talk about core inflation, there's also an, uh, an interesting historic development, which is that we know historically core inflation, by definition, is less volatile than the headline inflation. And it was certainly true in advanced economies. It was less true in emerging market economies if you buy these measures of core inflation, which in this case happened to be from the OECD. But in the more recent period, core inflation in both advanced and the emerging market economies that I've shown you behave more similarly. If you go back in time, there are differences in both the volatility and in the level. So that's a new development. Whether this will persist or not, of course, remains to be seen. All right, now let's move on to exchange rates. And here I have various things I'm going to, to draw conclusions from. So on the left you have, in this case, you have advanced economies. Uh, you have, again, since 2000, real exchange rate developments. You can see that the behavior looks more similar in the recent period, although when you blow up the more recent years, there's still some differences that remain, but some of the patterns look more similar across these three economies. Uh, than was previously the case. If you plot a series of real exchange rates with the highlighted one for South Africa since 2000, here it looks like a bit of a mess. It's all over the place. There's less evidence of the, some of the kinds of things that you saw on the previous slide. Another way of thinking about exchange rates is to talk about regimes. Well, you'll notice that South Africa and Mexico are stable throughout. They're the only ones that are listed based on these measures that uh, Carmen Reinhardt and others have developed over the years that are considered to be floating. And the others are anywhere between the peg and some kind of managed float, and they don't change that much. They're fairly sticky, as was, uh, I think, alluded to this morning. All right, so what are some of the takeaways from this? Well, there's a lot of volatility, as you can see, in real uh, effective exchange rates, and it's hard to extract a trend, even though the exchange rate regimes, especially in emerging markets, look, at least in theory, rather different. Uh, there seems to be, uh, however, in the behavior of real exchange rates, more homogeneity, roughly speaking, in the advanced economies I've shown than in the emerging markets. And if you buy the story about the exchange rate regime classifications, they're fairly sticky, with a few exceptions. And so one natural question to ask is, what conclusions should we draw for macroeconomic stability? And I'm going to argue at the end that one way in which central banks can uh, advance the conversation is to conduct, as I'll explain, some counterfactual experiments to further justify if you're a floater, and of course I'm Canadian, so floating is is something that we hold dear. If you feel that the floating exchange rate regime is worth pursuing, that the alternative is not better, then you need to do some 
additional research. Now, regarding, so the idea here is that the best, if you feel like the best defense is offense, and you can see from, this is for emerging markets as a group, uh, what has been noted already, which is the substantial rise in uh, reserves holding, although it has stabilized uh, more recently. And then let me move on then to uh, uh, something related to inflation, but closer to the, if you like, the heart of uh, what uh, central banking is about, which is expectations. And here I'll highlight uh, South Africa. This uh, is data from the Bureau of Economic Research that I have been using with uh, some of my colleagues at the Reserve Bank, including uh, Monique uh, Reed, and we've uh, used this data and published articles using this data. And the idea here is to talk about the sensitivity of expectations to shocks. So you can see the inflation target, you can see the target range and the behavior of uh, inflation expectations at different horizons. This is based on surveys on the left-hand side. And on the right-hand side is an example from the US which seems to suggest that in the more recent period, of course, expectations, and these are sort of uh, uh, five-year ahead expectations, that they are, in general, more stable, but the size of the shock, as you can clearly see from the right-hand side figure, has begun to sort of unmoor, if you like, a little bit these expectations. And you see something quite similar for emerging markets where we have some good data, such as uh, South Africa. And so this has implications, of course, for macroeconomic stability more generally. Then lastly, on the fiscal side, if you like, I'm going to show you just a few pictures about the, the threats and the risks there. You can see on the left-hand side the share of debt. And again, this is emerging markets as a whole. But on the right-hand side, you sort of, I'm thinking here of the the famous relationship between real interest rates and growth, or what academics refer to the, as the R minus G uh, question, uh, whereas emerging market growth rates, economic growth rates, were uh, consistently higher than in advanced economies, so as a form of catching up, if you like. But since uh, COVID, the gap between the two has either disappeared or remained very small, and that's, of course, a threat to the stability of uh, in debt dynamics. Uh, if you look at a few other pictures, different ways of looking at debt, again, the news is uh, not very good, although the last few observations suggest that what goes up can go down, so that's uh, a hopeful thing. So these are some of the takeaways from the fiscal side. So more defensive measures in the form of reserves holding. Central banks have uh, at times slipped in the, the credibility uh, based on expectations, but uh, uh, there is a reversal is uh, evident, at least in more recent data, and there are some threats from uh, debt and uh, economic growth. All right. Another final way before I reach to some sort of uh, discussion about some of the institutional aspects Again, this is uh, more evidence uh, from uh, ongoing work with uh, Monique Reed here. It's a very popular way of looking at what monetary policy does is to frame it in terms of some kind of policy rule with the most best known one being the Taylor rule and there are different ways of specifying it. I won't go into the details. Here my point is to ask if you have persistent deviations between what the Taylor rule prescribes as best practice in monetary policy versus what the central bank actually does, how do you treat those deviations? Is that a reflection of policy flexibility? Because you'll notice that if you buy these results, these deviations can be persistent, but they do fluctuate around zero. Do they tell us something about the nature of the shocks that prompts the central bank to deviate from what the Taylor rule might prescribe, and my argument is that the answer is that under an inflation targeting regime, that's precisely what may happen. Now, there is a caveat here, and that it depends in part, in large part perhaps, on what you think the neutral real rate is. Typically, we assume it's constant, but we can't do that anymore, and so our interpretation is going to be a function in large part by what we think the behavior of the neutral real rate is. 
So I think I've already said enough here, but uh, my takeaway is that it illustrates that a flexible version of inflation targeting is actually what's suitable. Now let me turn to institutions. Uh, we think, at least academics, and I think central bankers obviously uh, share this view that credibility is critical, but the profession struggles to define credibility. It's usually something that has to do between what's promised for inflation, whether it's a target or something about the target range, and the outturns in inflation, and usually it's the outturn in headline inflation. And credibility, if you think, is, is like a flow, and improvements in credibility help build trust, trust in the institution. Reductions in credibility, of course, offset trust. If you have a large stock of trust, then you can afford to lose credibility for a while. But if you don't, then uh, trust in the institution can evaporate fairly quickly. Now, without going into any of the technical details, I mentioned at the beginning the distinction between economic resilience and political resilience. And what this table simply illustrates is that if you believe credibility more or less along the lines I've just described, it's actually a little bit more sophisticated than that, but basically that's what it is. And if you think of political resilience as measured by, because we don't have very good ways of measuring it, property rights, then both are critical ingredients. And the way you interpret these results is that central bank uh, credibility improves resilience as we measure it. And we measure resilience as a, a combination of confidence in the institution, some macro att attributes, uh, the frequency and the severity of crises and a whole bunch of other variables. And to our surprise, I have to say, this is a joint work with Chris Hartwell, uh, these results are quite robust to techniques and uh, periods we look at, but credibility turns out to be crit a crit critical element in resilience. So any institution, any rethinking about the institution should take credibility seriously. Now, one thing that's omitted here is when we think of credibility, it's partly dependent on how transparent the central bank is. And we all know from this picture here that central bank transparency in both advanced and e emerging market economies has risen quite substantially. That's the good news, because that helps credibility. The bad news is that uh, if you believe some of these governance indicators, and we know they're problematic, these have deteriorated. And so these are potentially threats to the resilience of uh, institutions. So I'll skip this here in the interest of time. So what I would like to conclude with before giving you some sort of uh, takeaways uh, where I think we should go, uh, what I'm going to here try to argue in these next uh, couple of slides very quickly is that the way, the, it's basically another version of the best defense is offense, namely, if there is unhappiness or dissatisfaction with the current regime, whether it's the monetary policy regime or generally the level of inflation that's being target, targeted or the inflation targeting regime period, the type of exchange rate regime, one way institutions can advance the conversation is to consider counterfactuals, is to ask, well, all right, if you didn't have a floating regime but you imagined a world where instead the exchange rate was maintained through intervention, what will we find? It's a, a kind of a horse race. And this type of approach proved quite useful in Canada when the Bank of Canada was negotiating with the finance uh, m uh, department about renewing the inflation target. So here's a very simple toy model. One of the main limitations of this model is that I exclude fiscal policy, which obviously should be included. And here's some examples of some of the results that you extract if you imagine this counterfactual. So on the left-hand side, you take the observed data, and it asks uh, what happens, how does the real exchange rate respond to various shocks. So on the top, it's a measure of global shocks, and uh, the middle part is the differential between policy rates in the U.S. and South Africa, and the bottom one is the response of uh, forecast errors to the differential in policy rates. So you can see that they look fairly similar, except the middle one. And the middle one basically says that uh, under the counterfactual, where you imagine that the Reserve Bank intervenes somehow, 
We don't provide the details. That's a, partly an institutional matter. The differential uh, would raise competitiveness. So it sounds like maybe intervention might be an improvement. However, a lot of details are left out. And I certainly would not uh, reach any conclusion based on just this uh, toy model, but it's simply to illustrate that that's the way to proceed, which is to consider counterfactuals. So let me conclude then by talking about a few examples of uh, what I think uh, the way ahead I is. We're clearly in an era, for the, at least for the time being, where policies are more inward looking. That may give central banks the opportunity to improve how fiscal and monetary policy uh, coordinate, or if not uh, cooperate. Uh, I've already talked about the best defense being offense, and I gave the example of uh, some defensive measures. And whether that's in the form of foreign exchange reserves or in increasing the toolkit of unconventional monetary policies, that's a separate uh, discussion. Now, what about communication, which I haven't said very much about? Well, we already have heard from others that uh, central banks need to uh, acknowledge their uh, their limitations, some have referred to it as being more humble, but the other aspect I would like to highlight is this imbalance that uh, at least I as an academic have perceived over the last few years between backward and forward-looking policies. Inflation targeting was always sold to me as an illustration of why policy ought to be forward-looking, but central banks have hesitated in this connection, and they have to improve clarity about the balance between the two. Clearly, at some times, backward-looking is more important than forward-looking, but ultimately, monetary policy ought to be more forward-looking, because only then can you address the next questions, which is, if we reconsider the inflation target, the level, whether the range should be a zone of tolerance or intolerance, and uh, the, all these other elements, these can only be addressed if there's uh, more clarity in some of that communication. And if central banks engage more in these types of uh, counterfactuals, and then I'll conclude by saying uh, the warning, which we heard uh, this morning already, but this is the warning from Canada. But in this case, emerging markets and advanced economies are in the same boat. So there's no difference here, which is uh, clearly central banks face the tension between tightening uh, too little or reversing course or tightening too much uh, leading to a, a recession that they clearly wish to avoid. And I'll stop here. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Pierre. We've had three absolutely excellent presentations covering empirical issues, uh, conceptual issues, and, and more theoretical and uh, um, quantitative issues. Uh, if I can sort of start off on the questions, Fabrizio, and you know, l let me put the cat amongst the pigeons. Coming out of COVID, you had a, quite a clear situation in advanced economies with output, positive output gaps, tight labor markets, and rising inflation. The solution is quite simple. You need a consolidation, both monetary and fiscal. In developing countries in general, you've had rising inflation, but still negative output gaps. Right? You've, in many emerging markets, you battle to reach pre-COVID GDP levels. Um, you, in some ways, your, your, your presentation called for more fiscal consolidation uh, to, to, to solve that problem. You know, how do you think about output gaps in that context? I mean, is the, the, this concept of growth-friendly fiscal consolidation, is it a little bit like military intelligence? You know, I mean, ca can you really have growth-friendly fiscal consolidation? You know, and is that recipe for advanced economies the same as for emerging markets? Just as a, as a start, Fabrizio? Yeah, so, well, um, first of all, I think that, yeah, consolidation needs to take place, but then the, the question is uh, over what horizon and with uh, what degree of graduality, so how much it should be uh, back-loaded or front-loaded. And uh, I think it's interesting that the IMF has done some recent research that shows that successful consolidation tends to be, and, and this applies to emerging markets rather than advanced economy, tends to be back-loaded or gradual. Um, 
and this, uh, in, in the country that being successfully following this uh, more gradual strategy, the time that gradual consolidation buys uh, has been used to do structural reforms to boost uh, growth potential, that is very important. And, uh, and second, also to strengthen the, uh, the fiscal institution, institution in general. And of course, uh, so a gradual consolidation would take care of the problem of the output gap, in the sense that you don't have to, I mean, another, another finding in the literature that consolidation is more successful when, when uh, your economy is expanding, where you have positive output gaps, and also when the international conditions are uh, favorable in terms of, you know, you have uh, uh, strong global growth uh, and, and low risk aversion generally. Um, so, of course, uh, you need to, to adopt this, this more gradual strategy. You need to still have market access. Uh, you, don't, don't need, you don't want to be in a situation where you are close to, to lose uh, market access. And, uh, and it's absolutely uh, critical that you, you have the credibility to, to do the consolidation more gradually. And, and this means that you have to strengthen your institution now, not wait. Uh, for the future, for example, Fiscal Council can provide independent forecasts on which budgets are based. Uh, and this is one, one, you know, we know that this is a, when government make uh, forecasts on which they base the, the, their budget, they can be, they are systematically biased uh, their own direction. Uh, um, and, and then there are also uh, measures that you can take now that would take effect in the future, so will not affect uh, negatively output today, uh, but give the signal that you are serious about consolidation. So, uh, you know, think about age-related spending. You know, some emerging markets also have a big problem with aging population. So, so if you can come up with some uh, reforms today on pensions or health expenditure, then, then that could uh, create the expectation that this expenditure will be reduced in the future. That could also be a good, uh, good signal that will give you more credibility today to postpone the necessary consolidation. Thank you. Um, are there any hands? Uh, I've got Samantha and then uh, a lady in black there. Samantha, you want to go first? Thank you. Uh, thank you for some very interesting presentations. So, um, I guess I have two questions. One is uh, for Rafet. I think you were, you were mentioning um, tools like asset purchases being part of the normal central bank toolkit and not really unconventional. I was just wondering how useful, that is, how useful it is to think about it in that, um, in that sense because I guess in a way it kind of becomes <coughs> expected that this is a tool that's used more frequently um, and it's not just weaning treasury off it but also weaning the financial markets off um, a tool like that. And I, I guess over, over time, the more it gets used, you know, the less impactful it becomes. Um, so I guess the, the, the question is really just around the usefulness of that classification. Um, the second question is to peer around the FX intervention um, or the FX intervention stance. Um, how do you think about that vis-a-vis uh, -vis the, uh, the level of a country's uh, foreign exchange reserves um, and the relationship? Yeah, thanks. Uh, thanks. That, that was Samantha Springfield from the, the Saab. Um, the lady in black, if you don't mind, I can't Hello. see who you um, are. Just introduce yourself as well. Thank you. Monique Reed from the research unit of the South African Reserve Bank. Um, also directing a question at Rafet. You used a phrase that caught my attention. Um, you said you warned central bankers to think about the end game. Um, which for me is, is straight away makes me think about different horizons. And I was wondering, first of all, if I should think about your warning uh, as being consistent with the idea of um, time and consistency. And then linked to that, um, do you have suggestions of how, if we think about this warning in terms of time and consistency, how central banks should commit to a certain approach? So you identified sort of better reasons to use quantitative easing, such as the Reserve Bank, South African Reserve Bank had to do for financial stability reasons. 
Um, and once you've done, once you've been forced to use it for this legitimate reason, do you have some suggestions about how you could um, clearly communicate um, a commitment to prudence um, against, you know, perhaps using it for other reasons? Thank you, Monique. Uh, yes, sir. I'll take witness next. Yeah, thank you. My name is Luis Kasekende, uh, Executive Director of MEFMI. Mine is directed to Fabrizio and Pierre. Uh, we've heard uh, a lot about the defense coming through uh, uh, accumulation of reserves. But I wonder what metric should we use? Because uh, for a number of African countries, they have been using import cover. But what metric shall we use for the governors to be comfortable that I'm now holding an appropriate level of, uh, of reserves? And uh, what, so what should be the policy objective? Is it targeting a level of real exchange rate? Is it promoting stability in... Uh, in uh, this exchange rate, and what is the risk that uh, some politicians may see this as a way of uh, resisting any uh, adjustment in the exchange rate to shocks? Thank you. Thanks, witness, and then I'll hand over to the panel. Uh, thanks to the presenters. Uh, so, as you, my question is directed at Fabrizio. Uh, one of the things that I got from your presentation is that. Uh, there are different uh, impacts for EMs and advanced economies in terms of when debt or deficits increase, you tend to see an appreciation in the case of advanced economies and depreciation in the EMs. So I'm just trying to understand what underpins this uh, tendency or outcome. Uh, is it uh, sort of uh, perhaps biases in the sense of, uh, if you think of the, the, the lenders, uh, financial markets, how they perceive uh, the outcomes or the future dynamics of uh, evolution of debt in the different countries. So what is the rationale behind these differences? Thank you. Thank you for that. Should we start with Rifat and then we'll move that way? Thank you. These were very good comments and questions. So one was um, on, on QE and how um, it's not just an open market operation. Of course, um, in the sense that these are not treasuries, they are not treasuries, and that makes a difference. In terms of the balance sheet impact, you're buying securities. They're the same. Now, it's important to note that the difference comes from um, the, or one difference comes from the impact on the central bank's bottom line. And in that, um, actually, buying distressed assets is better business. Because although we worry about the political economy, distribution um, effects of this, if you are correct in your assessment and you are buying securities where you think that the pricing is not fundamental, you're buying them at too low prices and you're gonna make a profit on that. In fact, all central bankers have seen this. In fact, the Fed not only made an aggregate profit on its distressed asset portfolio, it made a profit on every single asset of those. Right? Now, QE is the opposite of this. Again, if you're correcting your assessment, you're buying these securities at the level where you've lowered the interest rate the most, so you're buying them at the peak prices. You can only make a loss on those. And all central bankers are learning the hard way that those losses have to be explained then. Right? So that difference is there. But from an implementation perspective, what you're doing is an open market operation. I disagreed with the statement that the more you use these facilities, the less effective they're going to be. I mean, your policy rate is not less effective because you've been using it for decades. It's not clear at all to me that if a central bank intervenes via its balance sheet, that eventually is going to be less effective. If somebody comes in and says, I'm going to buy unlimited amounts of securities, it's going to have a large effect regardless of how many times you've done that. Um, thinking about the end game and the time inconsistency, I think this is, this is really important. Um, time inconsistency isn't a big deal. And uh, although theoretically it's a very elegant concern, uh, in application, very few central banks actually have suffered from time inconsistency. And, uh, and the problem here isn't inconsistency of a single institution over time. It's the inconsistency between the desires of different institutions. A central bank will come in and think that it's going to do QE 
for a limited period. You may not know when exactly that limited period is in terms of time, but you clearly know the state, right? You are in exceptional times, so you're doing exceptional policies. Once you're out of the exceptional times, you're gonna stop doing the exceptional policies. That's not very difficult to think about. The problem is other policymakers will change their behavior because you're doing exceptional policies, and they will not want to change their behavior again when you want to normalize. And so that's the inconsistency between different policymakers, and that's the end game one has to think about. Now, how to clearly communicate this? I don't think communication with the public is very difficult. A central bank can come out and say, especially if you are a otherwise credible central bank anyway, you know, I'm buying these securities because I don't want this market to, you know, crack and die altogether. People will understand this, right? The problem is, how are you going to communicate this with the other policymakers? In particular, you know, your fiscal authority can say, fine, I'm going to let you do this, you know, shrink your balance sheet when the time comes. But between then and when it, the time actually comes, the government changes and the new government is not going to want that. That's a much trickier thing that one has to think about, and I don't have good guidance on that. Thank you. Pierre? Uh, thanks. So, so I'll combine the two because they're really about foreign exchange intervention. And uh, the example I gave, which was purely an illustration, uh, you could fault the model. So I'll put that aside. But even if you agree with this model, what it leaves out is the very important question of uh, what the central bank thinks the correct or appropriate real effective exchange rate equilibrium value is. And if you think estimates of the neutral real rate are uncertain, I can assure you that estimates of the equilibrium real interest rate, a uh, real exchange rate rather, are even more uncertain. But there's another aspect to foreign exchange intervention, at least historically, and here I'll draw a little bit, if you don't mind, from uh, the Canadian experience, which is that the Bank of Canada learned decades ago that it was a losing proposition to influence the level of the exchange rate. It then went through a phase where it thought it could manipulate or at least uh, put limits on the volatility of the exchange rate. And it learned hard lessons that way that that didn't work. So it's left with, and I think this is probably a good rule for most central banks, so I'm sure you can think of exceptions, to do two things. To, to say that intervention in foreign exchange markets is clearly the exception. It has to be a very large shock for the Bank of Canada to consider an ex foreign exchange intervention. But secondly, that it's preferable to do that in concert with other large central banks. Going it alone is not going to accomplish very much. But combined with other central banks, it may have some impact. Now here, the challenge for emerging markets is whether some of the large economies uh, or large foreign exchange markets will go along with uh, this kind of intervention. Um, right now, at least in the current environment, that's uh, doubtful. So I would simply say that uh, what I was trying to do is to say that the best way to illustrate the disadvantages of foreign exchange intervention to achieve a, a level or a volatility type of objective is to engage in this kind of exercise because then you clearly illustrate to the public and markets the, compl the complications, both market complications and institutional complications when you start to uh, intervene in these kinds of markets. Okay. Um, so there was a question on the uh, what criteria to use for uh, the accumulation of reserve, what should be the the objective of foreign in, uh, effects intervention. So I think here, uh, I, I believe that looking just at the import covenant would, would not be enough. I would say that you should at least, uh, and I think IMF also is using uh, uh, these criteria is to, is to look also the short run liability and have enough reserve that cover at least this, not only the import coverage. So in terms of objective, uh, you know, using effects intervention to, to stabilize, to keep, you know, generally central banks are, uh, uh, 
at least major emerging markets quite reluctant to uh, actually they don't target uh, exchange uh, rate levels they use effects intervention either to build reserves or to to smooth volatility temporarily but it, you know effects intervention should not be used and it's not used generally to uh, to uh, defend or prevent uh, 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 adjustment through the exchange rate. I mean, the experience of several countries that uh, the um, change in exchange rate have helped uh, uh, the, the macroeconomic adjustment in the economy. You can think also about the you know, several emerging uh, commodity exporters after 2014-15. So uh, depreciation also helped to, uh, it might have worked more through imports than, than export, but I had uh, help uh, absorb the, the shock from, from the uh, falling uh, in commodity prices and, and, and reduce uh, current account deficit in several countries. Now, on the, on the questions on uh, what is the mechanism, what is the difference between emerging market and advanced economies uh, regarding the link between fiscal deficit and inflation, I think the key difference is the behavior of the exchange rate. And, that, and the reason, and, and we, we uh, actually document in our paper that uh, exchange rate tend to depreciate in, uh, in emerging markets, and this depreciation is associated with an increase in sovereign risk, whether you measure it with CDS spreads or with, uh, with the rating, uh, agency ratings, uh, it's, a similar, it's a similar story. And, and then the, the fall in the exchange rate tends to ignite uh, inflation as well, uh, also because emerging markets have generally higher exchange rate pass-through. Uh, that said, these are general tendencies. It doesn't mean that an advanced economy can suffer uh, uh, deterioration of sovereign credit and a depreciation, obviously. Thank you, Fabrizio. We've got time for two more questions. There's one online. Can I see if there's any hands? I see one hand there. Okay, let's take the one hand here, and then uh, Tully will read the question online. Thank you, Kuben. Uh, this is Pierre. Uh, my question is uh, addressed to my namesake there, Pierre. I, I think I have two questions. Uh, to Pierre, I wanted to find out, and uh, maybe if you can elaborate, Sorry, Pierre, do you mind just speaking into the mic? So Pierre is asking Pierre a question. Yes. <laughs> uh, Pierre, I would like to find out if you can elaborate on cyclical fl fluctuation. Uh, if you can elaborate on how cyclical fl fluctuation impact the, uh, an emerging market effort to achieve and maintain macroeconomic stability. Is that a case for unconventional monetary policy? So that's the first question. Uh, the second question is related to the panel. Um, it's, it talks about, or it's related to environmental sustainability and macroeconomic stability. So the question is, how can emerging, mac, uh, emerging economies can balance economic growth with environmental uh, sustainability to ensure long-term stability? Thank you. Thank you. Tully? Sure, we have one question from Amagete Lejane from Standard Bank. She asked, to what extent is credibility vested across multiple institutions? So, how long can monetary policy credibility be maintained when you have a material erosion on fiscal policy credibility, regardless of how monetary policy makers behave? Thanks for that. Uh, who would like to start? Should we, Fabrizio or I'll Pierre, have you've got so the mic. I'll briefly, yeah. So uh, the answer to, well, the best answer I can give to the first question is that if you believe that resilience, as I've defined it or described it, matters, then in principle, conventional policy ought to work most of the time, and unconventional policy would then be the exception, which is <coughs> not, I hope, at least I don't think, too dissimilar to what Refet was saying. And I think I would just leave it at that. Uh, one of the difficulties with uh, going into more detail is that one of the things I've tried to explain is that emerging markets, uh, you can look at them in a group, but uh, they're quite heterogeneous, as you, can so you, see, you saw in particular with the behavior of the real exchange rate, but uh, the behavior of other uh, variables as well that I showed. So I don't want to 
to generalize uh, too much. Um, the, uh, the question about credibility, well, I was restricting myself to the credibility of monetary policy where the focus is on inflation performance. Uh, what I can imagine is that as long as that credibility is maintained in the way I've defined it, so some relationship between outturns of inflation and expectations of inflation, without going into any technical details, but I can imagine where there's a tipping point of some kind where something happens in uh, debt dynamics or in fiscal policy, which then spills over into expectations of inflation. And that's when the, the trouble uh, begins. So um, as long as uh, the uh, expectations of inflation somehow captures what's going on on the uh, debt side, then the conclusions I drew should hold. But I can imagine where there's some kind of rational inattention of some kind, and there's a tipping point where all of a sudden expectations change. And one of the things you can see in at least one of the slides that I showed you is that these expectations can be sensitive to large shocks, for example, like the tipping point I just mentioned, and they can fluctuate uh, quite a lot. So uh, the answer is that you know, if the deck dy dynamics are very unfavorable, then it will show up fairly quickly in expected inflation and uh, observed inflation, and you'll see the, the gap grow between the two and with the consequent loss of credibility. Thanks. Yeah. The online question quickly. Um, I see these as lexicographic. So first, you have to have a functional government with sustainable debt. Then you have to have a banking system that is you know, reasonably capitalized and alive, then you can do decent monetary policy. But if your government is dead, your banks are also dead, and you can't do monetary transmission. Your government might be solvent and functional, but your banking system might be dead nonetheless. You still can't do monetary policy because monetary policy is transmitted to the real economy through the financial system. If that financial system isn't there, what you do is irrelevant. So it really has to be that your fiscal stance has to be supportive of monetary policy. This is not a, only a question of consolidated government budget. It's a, also a question of whether your government is allowing your banking system to live. If your government is defaulting, usually the greatest counterpart is your banking system and their assets are gone. And what your central bank does in terms of monetary policy is essentially going to be irrelevant. Okay. So it really matters what your fiscal stance is, and in particular, whether your government is fiscally solvent or not. Thank you. Yes, so there was a question on the environmental sustainability. So I think that, you know, if you are a country exposed to natural disaster, more exposed than other, due to climate change, then, uh, I mean, this is, this is, a, this is, this should strengthen the uh, prudence in, uh, in fiscal policy. Now, from a technical point of view, then, then you clearly need to have uh, figure out how much buffer you need, fiscal buffer you need to, to cover the cost of, uh, of, uh, of this natural disaster. Um, and uh, there's no, I don't see a contradiction, you know, the, between, uh, I don't, in, at least in the longer term, there is no, no trade-off between uh, ins economic growth, ensuring financial stability, uh, and, uh, and, and the sustainability of public fina finance. Obviously, you want to avoid uh, to be in a situation where you're not able to cover uh, the cost of this uh, big uh, natural disaster, and you don't want to uh, your fiscal position then to affect the the financial system and so on. So I don't see actually in the longer run a uh, contradiction between these objectives. Um, yeah. Great, thank you. Thank you Fabrizio, Refet and Pierre for a really engaging session and thank you for your contributions. Uh, we meet back at 3.40. Uh, Rashad stole 10 minutes from Chris, Chris stole 10 minutes from lunch. I'll stole 10 minutes from the next session. Uh, so can we please be punctual 3.40 back. Thank you, everybody. <laughs>